Welcome back to Nam's Decision Podcast. I am your host, Deepalm. Follow me on Twitter at Deepalm66. Follow the show on Twitter at UDPod. Follow the entire MTR network at the MTR network. You found us. Don't lose us. Subscribe in the iTunes store. Subscribe everywhere podcasts are giving away for absolutely free. Leave that five-star review. I'll read it on the air during our regular shows, not during podcasts because everything is so crazy. That's right. You've tuned into Podcast Week. We're here at day two. You listened yesterday while myself and Chad Floyd um, were a bit arrogant. I'm not going to lie. We got a little it, – it got, it got weird. We went from normal Georgia fans to turn into cocky Georgia fans really crass and, like, a little unnervingly. But, this, I mean, I'll be honest, the schedule's not too scary except for that nighttime trip to LSU. That's the one that gets me the most. Auburn's coming to Athens. But it's important that we also have a lens on the larger football landscape, as I've been told they play football outside of places like Athens. I've been told this. We're going to find out today. We've got from Stadium, Mike Felder, um, your favorite podcast, your favorite podcaster. What's up, Felder? Man, I am living the dream. Uh, you said yeah. you're scared of a night game at LSU. For what? For why? Why? Why are you scared? What does that scare you? I've been a Georgia fan for 33 years. I've seen a lot of things that, that probably shouldn't have scared me that eventually did. LSU sucks. LSU can suck. That's, hey, I'll give you that. LSU does suck, but guess what? Georgia has a tendency to do bad things on the road. Yeah. No, I think LSU actually has an opportunity to be good this year. So your, your fear is probably directly in line, but like as they are right now, they're not good, but they could get good. Yeah, and the thing is, the timing of the game gets me too. I think it's a, a, a mid-October game. They might be good by then. Exactly, and that's why I'm worried. And then it comes, so the LSU game comes right before Kentucky, and then Auburn right after that. So then the Kentucky game turns into a trap game, which also I don't like because I think we're at Lexington this year, which things never go well for us at Lexington when we're overlooking them. So I've the already done, that, I've dealt with my Georgia feelings. You're usually my angel of death. So this is my <laughs> third year doing podcast week. And every year I kick off the Georgia preview, and our second show is invariably the national picture preview where invariably I invite Michael Felder on and invariably tells me why I was so wrong to be so happy this <laughs> way before. Um, for those of you keeping track at home, tomorrow's podcast week will involve my left tackle from college and soon to be married person, Barso, as we do a preview of the AFC Thursday show as Nata the Scribe from Up Rocks, from damn near everywhere. Uh, he's also uh, helped us preview the NFC and on Sat on Friday, excuse me, podcast week will come to a triumphant end with our annual Summer Sam preview with myself, Rich Fan, Cam Hawkins from PW Torch, and friend of the show, Sam Franco. But again, today we've got Felder on. When you've got Felder on, you talk college football or the challenge. And since I'm a week behind on the current challenge, we're going to focus on college football today. Is that all right with you? Yeah, that's fine with me. I am not, I've been moving, so I haven't been caught up on, I'm not, my wife is fully caught up on the challenge. I'm not even close, but I do know that someone told Cara Maria that she needs to grow up. Yo, Carmaria, see, now you're going to distract me, because Carmaria <laughs> did catch a real, real, real good speech with someone very recently, and I was like, yo, I was, I was one of those people who was like, the challenge has gotten too, I apologize for people who are here to talk about football. Give us a <laughs> <laughs> the challenge has gotten to the point where, like, if you were talking about other reality shows, I scoff because the OG will always be real world, which is now a feeder system to the challenge, and... Yeah. What they've done with the challenge now is they kind of saturate the market. You got challenge versus pros, all this stuff. I skipped those. I'm here for the big, the big shows. This is season 32. They're now yeah. counting it as part of the trilogy from uh, 30 and from last uh, season. Which kind of calling it like the Vengeance trilogy, whatever. <laughs> Maybe they thought about it late in the game, but I'm here for it. Like it's been a very entertaining season. The outsider people who I don't care about from who are you the one and the brother are being dealt with as they should. And I applaud real G's like CT like Zach and like Jonathan Daniels coming through every Tuesday entertaining me. It means, it means I, a lot. I love it. I absolutely love it. I love it. And also, and also the illegal drug dealers should get them their steroids. Big ups to those people because – So many steroids for Zach. They are so much more entertaining now that they're back on cycles. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about – that's not it's such a distraction. <laughs> let's talk about last year because last year ended um, poorly, I'd say. Because as someone who was in the oh, building oh, and very, very upset with oh, uh, the blown off sides call and with the eventual heroics of uh, the backup quarterback down in uh, Alabama. If someone would have told you a season ago that you would have been in the national championship game, you would have said, absolutely, give it to me right now. You're right. You're not wrong. I'm not going to debate that. That's a, that's a factual statement. However, upon reaching said national title game, 
to watch what happened in per like I brought my father, man. But my dad. That's good. <sighs> it's a memory that you're gonna have forever. Watching That's super rude, man. Watching the Hawaiian so go out there, rip your heart out, like cut it out with a spoon, to go to work. Um, by the way, I will say this, patting myself on the back literally right now. Tua should have been the starter the whole time. I said that in 2016, in May of 2016, that Tua is the answer to their quarterback problems. We will get to Alabama <laughs> in a second. But this is actually something I'll talk about because the playoff ended in a way that many playoff originators or progenitors feared two SEC teams battling it out for the title yeah. of the biggest sport spot in the sport. And you and I have talked about this before, and I'm not entirely sure where you stand on this. We're going into year four of the playoff. I'm, I'm, I'm the guy who was like the BCS or nothing. Bro. You're fixing a problem that doesn't exist. You're inventing yeah. a problem to fix it. That's why we have a playoff. Year four, we've had. I mean, I can't debate the quality of games. They've been entertaining as hell. But we're here, starting to hear even louder rumblings of there aren't enough teams in, and how can two SEC, SEC teams make it? And when you listen to those critics. Do you think we're going to end up with eight or more teams in this playoff system? Not until at least, what, 2025? When the that's when, contract that's when the contract's up, yeah. So not at least until 2025. I, I do not want more than four teams. Uh, I think when you get above four, now we start to talk about eight, and eight leads to automatic bids. And right. automatic bids mean teams that don't belong in there at all getting an opportunity. And I think a lot of people are so bent on, are so fixated on this idea of giving people a chance. And I'm in the, op I'm completely the opposite from that. I, I want to take as many chances away as I can because you don't deserve it and you're not good enough. And the championship is elite for a reason. Or exactly. Like, I don't think you should get to play. Like, I think about it from a, like, I think about it like what I think about Shaq. Like, you, you shouldn't get to play your way into shape. And I think that's what happens when we go to eight or we go to the 16. You have a team that, yeah, you know what? We, we, we stumbled out of the gate, but we did win the last nine games of the season and we're hot right now. So we should get a shot. And I don't want you to get a shot. You should have come out of the gate hot or guess what? Your athletic director should have scheduled some sorry teams for you to beat while you were still stretching your legs. But I don't want a team to play them, themselves into shape and then be a monster by the time they get to the finals. I want a team that's wire to wire, maybe with a stumble or two stumbles. Um, I want that team to play, in, play for the championship. I was fine with the BCS, just like you were. Um, and now, and I, I guess maybe this is one of those things that because we played football, you know that you're not good, right? Like, well, you know when your team, <laughs> like, when you know your team's not that good, it's like, ah. Right. My, my senior year of high school, my junior year, I was the only junior starting on the defense. We finished uh, ten, our nine and or ten and no nine and one in the regular season. Right. I was the state tennis. My senior year, as the only returning starter on defense, Oops. I knew we were bad. Yeah, and I think that I think that people it's so polluted with this idea of deserving a chance or give someone a chance. We all need a chance that. You're you're muddy you're muddying things up. You're 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 turning stuff that should be black and white into gray, and that doesn't make it better. Certainly doesn't make the product better. Like I think that the the Peach Bowl, for example, with was it Auburn and Central Florida, that's a better football game as just those two teams squaring off than pretending like they belong in some sort of push for the championship. And I think what's happened is, especially particularly in probably your and I's post playing lifetime, as we both graduated in 07 from college is that we've watched football go from a regional sport to a national sport, like yeah. very quickly, to yep. where winning the SEC doesn't matter to people. Right. Like yeah, when, I think, when I got a point to, to Rick making a title game, SEC title game with Aaron Murray and coming up just short, like, yeah, we didn't win, he didn't win it. I'm like, that used to matter. Playing in the SEC title game used to matter. Like, yep. for people to act like college football is a zero-sum game, for me, it feels like people who don't understand college football. Yeah, oh, they're quote-unquote lesser bowls. Every bowl matters to the kids who earn their way there. And by yeah. telling them it doesn't, now you devalue the entire system. Yeah, I, I'm 100% on board with you. I think that the Rose, like, the Rose Bowl used to matter. Like, it getting to, to play in the thing. Rose Bowl, that was a huge thing for Big Ten, Pac-12 teams. And now it's just like, if it's not a semifinal, people are like, screw it. Like, why would I want to play in the Rose Bowl? I want to go yeah. to the playoff. 
the ratings bear out. It doesn't, it's not just the players who take the luster away from these games. It's the viewers. Yeah, yep. you get the spike, of course, the timing-wise, but we watched the playoff viewership spike in the bowl. Honestly, like I got invited to do bowl picking last year, and I was like, I don't have the time. And normally, that's, that's, that's my thing. I love that kind of shit. And now, yeah. uh, you know, even me, I fall in the trap of the only two games that matter are these playoff games. And I think it's in a detriment to the sport because now college football isn't what it used to be. And that sounds like very much old man yells at cloud, but it's true. College football used to be a thing that was unique and representative of a very unique subset of football. I say college basketball, I don't watch it because it's lesser than the NBA. I will always watch college football because to me, it feels like a different sport than yeah. the NFL. 100% agree. And I, I literally was going to say, you run that risk of turning it into college basketball, which Mm -hmm. is who cares for none of this matters to the tournament until the tournament. And the bigger you make that field for the playoff for college football, the less people will care about the week to week of the regular season. And for my money, the less important the champion is because then it doesn't come down to you are consistently elite throughout the season. It comes down to you got hot when you need to get hot. Yeah, playing yourself into shape. Exactly. Like, that's the <laughs> see, that's a callback. Yes, sir. That's what they call it. Um, also, talking about this, you and I were discussing before the show, year four of the playoff, the one thing we haven't seen in these big four spots has been smaller teams. Say what you about the BCS, but Boise State, these Mountain West teams found a way to national uh, platforms of prominence due to the open availability of the BCS, due to a slot being available to them. Boise State was not a thing pre-BCS. It just wasn't. It wasn't right. a thing pre-beating Oklahoma. That you create matchups that you will talk about for a lifetime because these small teams that shouldn't be getting recruits and shouldn't be getting wins, picking up these wins gets them recruits and gets you that quote-unquote parity you say you want in your sport. Yeah, I, I think that – and one of the big things is um, Dennis Dodd wrote an article about this in like 2012, and he called it Hush Money and Shoulder Pads, where – What we basically, what we basically did, remember, it used to be the, it used to be the, the BCS six, right? Mm -hmm. Now it's the power five, which means we've taken one entire conference and pushed it out. The big, the old big East, now the American. So the Mac, the Mountain West, the Sun Belt, Conference USA, and the American are all on the outside looking in and they have one spot for more teams. And it just, it doesn't make any sense. Like, they, they have no chance. And for all the discussion of Houston, well, Houston did it or Central Florida did it. Neither one of those schools have built the sort of brand that Boise State or TCU or even Utah was able to build. And they're consist like, it's not going to be, it's not, it won't, like, it won't, like you said it best, it's never going to be the way that it used to be. And I also, I will say this, I think that also the saturation of football as a money product, when you talk about cable television, I think that's also lended itself to the same idea where it used to be like, oh man, if you just stay up late enough, you'll watch Boise State. Well, guess what? Now, if you stay up late enough, you can watch USC. So what's the difference? (laughs) If you stay on on Thursday night, we'll get to watch TCU. Uh, Thursday night, you can watch uh, freaking Rutgers. So like... I think all these things are working together as they try to chase this dollar number, this, this money. None of it's, wor- it's, it's not working for this little guy, but the little guys get broken off a little bigger chunk. They get to run their athletic department, but they've sold their... Um, they sold away their ceiling. Boom. They sold, their ceiling. Access, they sold their access for extra dollars, 100%. 100%. I, I couldn't agree more. It's super interesting even to have you mention Utah because... That's another thing that we're going to start missing out on as this thing plays itself out, the innovation of coaches. Because Utah yep. won the way they did and did it on such a big stage, Urban Meyer and his innovative offense were noticed and brought into Florida. Now, not, not besmirching him in any way, when Georgia goes for a hire, they go for a successful assistant at yep. an already established school. You'll see, you won't see large teams taking chances on coaches It's the reason why Turner Gill should have left when he did. And I always come back to Turner Gill because he's like a cautionary tale. No, but, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> like, these coaches, this ingenuity, this thing that make college football college football, you're going to start seeing a lot of Bama clones, and that's not necessarily good for the product. I mean, I think it's great for the product, personally. I, mean, I know what you mean because of the – partially because of all how good the DB play is. It's, uh, D, first of all, Alabama's DBs, good last year, bad for the five years before that. 
Um, but I will that, say, I think that is strong. You're also very hard on their DBs. Yeah, because they, they're five stars. They should be better. <laughs> but like, I think it's good because you have less mistakes. And mm-hmm. but I think that college football fans won't admit this. You and I, we've talked about this before. College football is a sport riddled with subpar play and humongous mistakes. Like big plays don't just happen. Yeah, big plays come because someone screwed up. Somebody messes up. <laughs> People mess up. Like if this was if if these guys were in the NFL getting paid, they would be uh, you would cut 75% of your roster every week. It's it's what I tell everyone. There's no more reliable subgroup in America than the 18 to 21 year old American male. There just isn't. And you can say, oh, they're athlete, <laughs> elite athletes and they're football sure. savants. Guess what? They're also children who are going to fuck up. Like, I'm sorry. All just All the time. All, all the time. time. All the time. I oh, mean, you didn't even – you didn't even – oh, they told you the personnel package and you didn't even realize the tight end was on the left side, so you lined <laughs> up on the right side right next to your teammate who you're supposed to be on the opposite side of, and then he just scored a wide-open touchdown? Oh, that's college football, baby. What people don't get is that when you see people like waving people around on defense, it's not because they heard different things. Someone's no. just got out wrong. Yeah. Especially you throw in a guy who doesn't know what he's doing in general, and he's just like, oh, and they did something weird. Like, how many times do you watch a game and you see unbalanced come out and you're like, if you why, watch why defense have a connection? Like, this why, is like, why is the nose guard? Why is the nose guard over the center? It's unbalanced. Get over, get over the guard. Get over the guard. And they don't adjust. Now you have two guys in one gap. You have two guys, two offensive linemen, opening up a gap that's as big as a truck. Oh, wow, they scored a touchdown. Yeah, I know, because these guys don't know what they're doing. See, now I figured out why you like this podcast so much, doing this every year, because you get to be annoyed about football nerd things with me. Yeah, well, I mean, it just – there's no way I can walk into my office and complain about this stuff because people are like, I, that was a great play. And I'm like, no, it was a no, horrible play. It was a terrible play. <laughs> it's 100% true. And it's kind of, and, and without getting, putting like too much of a, a point on it, it feels like what's happened with the larger idea of college football because yeah, you overthought the problem. Mm-hmm. The problem yeah. was that, yes, the BCS was the solution because guess what? The BCS was computers. And everybody really bitched about computers. Go look at Condoleezza Rice's mentions in January. Oh, oh. Go look at these people on the committee. You say you want the human element. Are you sure you want the human element? Because pretty soon we're going to be calling for more robots. <laughs> the fact that Bama made the playoff was touted as a conspiracy by three fourths of the country. Yeah. Meanwhile, the other quarter and people who've watched football are like, no, Bama needs to be in. Oh, I mean, it's all, it's all one of the, like the whole, the distrust of technology and like the, the, hey, this is a different, this is a completely different podcast where we talk about how being stupid makes you really smart actually in today's America because learning (laughs) anything is absolute poison to people. And there's people, literally adults that would rather ask someone online a question than just look it up themselves. And it's, yeah, but that's what helps lead to this demise. And I just hope the sport doesn't basically, you know, eat itself, which is what may, what will happen when they start to, you can't sustain the, the, the contracts, the money, the whole deal. If you become a playoff only sport, Mm -hmm. but that's the path that it seems like fans want to head down. And I will say this, everyone keeps talking about, you got to treat the fans better, treat the fans better. You got to treat the fans better. Sometimes you got to protect fans from themselves. And Mm -hmm. this is one of those times. Fans don't know what they want. They think they know what they want, but they don't know what they want. Like, they wanted yeah. the BCS for a while. Fans yeah. are fickle. Yeah. Fans are children. You have to treat any group of people as the dumbest person in that group. And I don't know yep. if you've met a whole bunch of fans, the dumbest person in that group is pretty dumb. Yeah. Well, what's the saying? The saying is, person is smart. People are dumb. And people in, in raptured in sports are dumber. They're the worst. <laughs> well, I had a section on this podcast for outsiders, but I think we kind of put it in the bud and point out the point I wanted to make is that I don't care how good your outsider team is, it's going to take an act of God to get him in this playoff. For sure. Oh, 100%. I think FAU with Devin Singletary is going to be a very good football team. I think, obviously, Boise State with Brett Rippon, they're going to be a very good football team. Colorado State should be pretty good. I love Fresno State because I'm a humongous Jeff Tedford stan all day. but. 
at the end of the day, it does. They're gonna the, the best bet for them is what the the Fiesta Bowl this year or the Cotton Bowl or whatever it is. So like that's the best bet for them. But those teams will be good. Make sure you watch them. And if you get a chance, if you're watching any Conference USA teams, make sure you watch them on at Watch Stadium or download the Stadium app. But certainly, um, there's going to be some good teams. It's just a matter of if we're talking about playing themselves in. I think Boise State may have the best shot simply because they still have name cachet across the board more than Central Florida with Mackenzie Milton, more than FAU, even with Lane Kiffin. I think Boise State's still a name that people are like, oh, yeah, remember this team? They were good. Yeah. Yeah, but I think it's one thing to have the, the voice of the zeitgeist and the memory. Another thing to say, enough teams in the power – in the what they're calling the power five to free mm-hmm. up a spot in a four-team playoff. Oh, everyone has to lose. Like, you got to have three loss. Two, you, got, you need to probably have – of the power five, you would have to have two or three three-loss conference champions – with no one loss, like didn't make it to the conference championship game teams for this to be a reality. A hundred percent. Well, let's start with teams that have a chance. We'll start out West and work our way East. The Pac-12. The Pac-12 last year, again, didn't put anyone in the playoff. <laughs> and is this three in a row now? No, no, because Washington yeah. got in Washington got there in after 16. the 2016 season. They got smashed out, but they got they in. They smashed out, but they did get in. It's interesting because if I was doing my research for this, the first story that jumped out to me was, yo, Mike Leach is still employed. Man. Like, Mike Leach is out here in, in, under, the, under the auspices of one of the highest paid employees in the state of Washington and on the road to recruit a better quality of athlete to that place. And he came out and said the things he said, like, very publicly and didn't back down. How do you still employ Mike Leach in, on this as we record August 11th in the year of our Lord 2018? He's so quirky. He retweeted that monkey video. And? Like, I listen, what do you, what do you want from me? I don't know. I don't, that's, it's insane to me, too. Like, I don't get it. It, it, it makes sense. Like, the last three years, they won 20 wars. He's info, he's info wars. He's, he is info wars. They won 26 games in the last three years. They don't have a quarterback right now. Yeah, they've got four guys up for the up for the battle. Uh, I think that personally, I think Cameron Cooper should get the nod. He's the freshman who just can sling it around the yard. He's very good, very talented. Um, I think he's a redshirt freshman actually. And but they've got uh, goodness gracious, the Tins, Tinsley is who everyone thinks is going to be the quarterback. I think Cameron Cooper though, just quick ball comes out of his hands very quick. Uh, at the end of the day, I don't think who the quarterback is matters a ton because they can get the job done. It's not like he's going to have a superstar or he'll have a quarterback that he makes into a superstar. The question for me, the biggest, the biggest issue for me is not the quarterback. It's they lost Alex Grinch, the defensive coordinator. He's now at Ohio State. And that defense that they had was super salty. Like those guys were, they were rude dudes. And not having that, cuts away some of your leeway. I think we're still looking at a team that can win seven or eight games, but certainly I don't think that they are going to be, hey, maybe they're a dark horse to win the Pac-12 North the way they were the last couple seasons. Well, I think that the clear winner of the Pac-12, in my opinion, is in the same state, and that's Washington. Uh, Chris really? Peterson. Uh, I think they, look, you look at them, you look at what they did two years ago, somehow Jake Browning is still in college. I assume he's a dentist. <laughs> <laughs> You look, you look at the defense last year. They bring back, like I said, 16 starters. I, I feel good about them going into this. What do you think about the Pac-12? Is, is Washington not your pick? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick Stanford or Oregon. I think one of those two teams okay. will win it. Um, I, at Washington, this is the thing that gets me with Washington. They play small guy football. Um, sure. And not, not, like, not small guy, like little, like not physically imposing, but like, they play football the way you'd play if you're in the Mountain West or the way you'd play if you're in the, the, the Conference USA or whatever because they play games where they just kind of sleepwalk through stuff. I mean, the Arizona State game last year was a 100% joke, and they should have bossed up and beat the hell out of that team, but instead they're like, well, maybe we can just get it done like this. We just have, All we have to do is just win this one, and then we'll be okay. And so I think that they still, as they improve their recruiting, which he's certainly doing, uh, speaking of Chris Peterson, I think that the big thing for me is that they just they leave a lot on the table and they don't mm. seize the day. And 
when you lose a guy like a Vita Vea, like a Vita Vea, and you lose obviously Dante Pettis, the best kick returner in the history of college football. Um, I think that it, it, you, you take a step back. And even though I love Jojo McIntosh, and I'll tell you this, anyone watching Washington play this year, look for Greg Gaines, a defensive tackle. Um, his helmet looks like it is painted on because his <laughs> face is stuffed inside of it. Um, I love those guys. I think they're phenomenal. Um, I think Jake Browning is, again, he's a quarterback that looks like he should be playing at Boise State, not playing – Not you know, he's not a – I don't think he's a Pac-12 full-blown starter. I think – it's, when I look at when I look at Stanford, when I look at um, Oregon, I think Justin Herbert's probably the best quarterback in college football this year. Um, at least that's draft eligible. Excuse right. me. And I think Oregon has weapons that are that get me super excited. Uh, headlined by Dylan Mitchell. Uh, defensively, Oregon obviously has a ways to go, but I think they've got an opportunity to go out and make some big time plays. And then Stanford, obviously, Bryce Love. Is the is the headliner, but I think KJ Costello and Davis Mills are both quality quarterbacks. I look at what they have uh, with respect to Caden to Caden Smith, and you throw in JJ Arcega Whiteside, and of course Connor Weddington, who caught 31 balls for them a year ago. A lot of short passes. I think he's going to have an opportunity to turn those into big games this year. So I think Stanford and Oregon, to me, even though they won't get the national recognition out of the gate, I think those two are the class of that Pac-12 North. I think it's going to be very interesting that Washington opens up playing Auburn in Atlanta. We're going to have a lot of a questions answered about them, I think, fairly early. I think you're yeah. right. It's been interesting since the Chris Peterson hire that his recruiting strategy never really changed. He's still recruiting like he's at Boise State. And yeah. They get some guys. They get a few guys. They, they got a guy that was like a five-star linebacker, and then he was like, no, I'm not coming here. I'm going to Alabama. Goodbye. And he did that this past week, which is insane. But, like – he gets some guys. I like Salvin Ahmed and obviously um, Colson Yankoff and Jacob Sermon are two elite 11 quarterbacks that he has there now. But like, it's, it's just, I don't know. It's just, he's, I don't think that they've taken, I don't think it feels like they haven't fully committed to taking that next step to be in a monster, you know? Right. No, I think you're right. Let's, uh, let's go next to the big, uh, the big 12. By the way, by the way, Pac-12 South, Khalil Tate, love him, have loved him for a long time. <laughs> Pac-12 South, I think Utah's the best team, but I think USC wins that one uh, with JT Daniels, who it should be in high school right now, but he reclassed and has uh, skipped a grade to play foot, to be the starting quarterback at USC this year. Hey, can I also ask you about the Herm Edwards thing? Like, what are we doing? Um, I was super skeptical at first, but I've got a friend of a friend who is one of works in the athletic department, and the whole goal for them is to, like, they got to manage their money, you know? And they're like, we can't afford to pay a coach like millions of dollars. So, so what go, we, for the, go for the feel good. So let's not the feel good, but like, let's find a way to like make this work where we have more of a, like a corporate structure where we can replace pieces without having to replace the whole part. And so it's an interesting take because if it works at you, if it works at Arizona state, then maybe it works at Vanderbilt or maybe it works at Wake Forest or maybe it works at, 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 uh, at, at, um, at Minnesota or it works somewhere else where you, you listen, we got it. We just need a guy that knows football very well that can put things in place. And then we got these other young guys that we know we're going to lose, but they kind of design all the pieces. So I'm curious to watch it. I don't think they're going to be very good, but I was pleasantly surprised to look at their depth chart and not see, devil and tiger and shark <laughs> as positions, which really screws up my spreadsheets. <laughs> That's fair. Let's go to the pack to the big 12 next. Excuse me. <laughs> um, Oklahoma made it out last year. They made it to the playoff. Yeah. They lost to some team from Athens um, in a very <laughs> entertaining football game. Oh, I'm going to talk a lot of shit. Don't worry about that. Um, that was the most impressive game that Georgia played all season without it now. That, that stand by Roquan Smith is – my favorite play in the last 20 years of college football. I, who's the kid? Was it t Tyler Branch? Yes. The things that he did in that football game went unmentioned by a lot of people, but I thought he was the star of the game for his second half where he found ways to terrorize Baker Mayfield but also get to, get to Rodney Anderson and stop him in the backfield a few times. Like he was, I thought he was lighted out. He lived on the outside edge of the, of the, of the shoulder pad and just got upfield. 
And it's so yeah. much and for all the things we can say about technique and and but if you can just consistently beat your man off the line as a defensive lineman, yep. you're gonna change everything. Yep. It was it was he was I thought he was amazing. So it was it was so much fun. But super know, props to your guys for that one. That was that was because remember, they hadn't won a game where they had to score 30 points. It's true. And then they got out. I thought Oklahoma was going to beat the wheels off of them. It was, and, it was tight in my house in the first half, I'm not going to lie. And then they grew up. That was, I thought that was maybe, that was, honestly, for me, probably the, 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 the game I'd compare it to is probably Texas A&M versus Alabama. Not the first year with Johnny Manziel, the second year when Alabama had to score 45 in College Station to get the W. Yeah. It was that type of yeah. football game where you play completely out of character and you come home with the W. That was very impressive. It's one of the reasons I'm really so high on Georgia this year, honestly. Oklahoma loses Baker Mayfield. It mm-hmm. lose Mark Andrews. It was Orlando Brown. Holy mm-hmm. shit, there's the best team in the conference. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> it's not even close. Like, I was looking at some of them. Just, I was like, wait a second. The next team I could make an argument for is Texas, whose big push last year was an improvement of two wins. I just – I don't I don't believe in Tom Herman yet. No, no one should. What's happened – my bigger question is, what the hell happened to the, the Big 12? It's just bad, man. Like, it's just not good. It's not great football. Um, you look at the – I think at the end of the day, what we're dealing with is a conference that's in transition, and they're in transition all over where – Texas, obviously, is still trying to find its identity. They need to find a quarterback, which has been a humongous problem. For a guy that created the whole JT Barrett thing and got through that to get to Greg Ward, and now he – maybe he just needs a black kid, right? Like, maybe that's what it is for Tom Herman. He's like, I can't do anything with these white guys. I need, like – I give me, give me a brother out here running the corner. He's got to find something because this is – whatever he's doing isn't working. It's I know – we talked about earlier how, like, you see less of the transition from small school to big school, but Houston and Texas is definitely one of those pushes. This is also the problem with that because some coaches can't make that leap. Because yeah, yeah. You say what you will, football is football. It's not. It's no, just it's not. playing not. Because not. in Texas, you're dealing with – it's like I saw everyone, how much does they say to make it bad? He's worth about twice. Yes. Because he does more than coach a football team. He basically runs Tuscaloosa as his own personal fiefdom. And I'm not sure Tom Herman can do that in Austin. You have to, well, you have, think about what you have to manage when you walk into that locker room. You have to, it's not like every college locker room is filled with, I was the best player at my high school. Mm-hmm. Yep. But this is a locker room that's filled with, I was the best player in my state. I was the best player <laughs> in the city of Dallas. I was the best, I was the best player, period. In high school, period. Like, you're, at, at, at Houston, you're getting kids who either made a mistake they or, or, or were never on that level. They feel lucky to get a chance to keep playing football, with the exception and of Ed Oliver, the best player in the country. Best player in the country. Um, yeah, you're right, because at Texas now, it's, it's, it's an entirely different breed of athlete. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure, after watching only a two-game improvement, if the ears are still open. Because there's one thing Mac Brown taught me in Texas, you can lose that locker room with the quickness. In a hurry, yeah. So I, I'm curious to watch him. I think he – I don't think he – I just don't think his quarterbacks, like, I don't think those guys want smoke. Like, and for Tom Herman, the way that he likes to play football, you got to have a guy that's got, like, big stones that wants to come out there and just blow the doors off everyone. And he had it in JT Barrett. He obviously had it in Greg Ward. He does not have it right now in Texas. And until he finds that, it doesn't matter what else he has in terms of pieces, they're going to have a real problem. So I, I think Texas, to me, is probably the fourth best team in this league. I think TCU is probably the second best team with Sean Robinson. Sean Robinson's got a lot of stuff to clean up about his game, but I think he's going to be their starter. I think he's got an opportunity with Darius Anderson, with Cavante Turpin, uh, to, with Tay Barber, a freshman that they have there, to really make some things happen. He has Jalen Rager as a playmaker. And then I think, excuse me, the next one for me is probably Oklahoma State a team that obviously has massive losses, but I think Justice Hill and Justice Hill gives them a steady on the offensive side of the ball until they find their wide receivers that can go out and make plays. So I think Oklahoma one, TCU two, and then Oklahoma state, Texas are three, four and Iowa state's an interesting one to me because David Montgomery is very good at the running back spot, but they lost some pieces in the wide receiving game. That's going to make it tough for them to contend. 
if I'm going to pick a sleeper, it's certainly going to be Iowa State. If I'm going to pick uh, the winner contender, it's going to be Oklahoma. Kyler Murray is going to be just fine. Everyone that keeps talking about, how do you replace Baker Mayfield? Kyler Murray <laughs> is going to be fine. Lincoln, Lincoln Riley is a hell of a football coach. Kyler Murray, is going to be just, Kyler Murray is going to be fine. And I think he opens up while well, he can't do all the stuff that Baker did because Baker Mayfield was – Baker Mayfield shepherded the best offense that we've seen in the last probably 30 years of college football. I think people that's lost some people because they were doing it in the Big 12. Sure. But you're right. Like when I watched them, and 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 I do treat Georgia's horn on defensively because I think they were very good, very talented last year. Go watch that Georgia Oklahoma game again. There are points in that first quarter where a very talented Georgia defense has no idea what's coming. Here's here's what I will tell you. I did a video about Oklahoma versus Georgia. And I, what I realized was that Oklahoma doesn't their their third down conversion percentage was very was very mediocre. It was super mediocre. Okay, and then I was like, why is their third downs? Why are their third downs so low? Like they converted forty two percent of their third downs. Ugh. Right, that's bad. Right, not for a, te- a team a team of that uh, of that prominence. Yeah, it's really bad. Yeah, you know why? Because they only they they only had 162 third downs for 14 games, which is obscene. Like that's, that's they're obscene. like, what's a third down? Who cares? <laughs> what? I, that's first of all, that's a stat I wasn't prepared to hear today. I'm not just dump me off, I'm off my uh, post a little bit here. I did want to ask you before we got out of the Big 12. Okay. They gave up 31 and a half points a game last year, and the defense got worse. I get it. I'm watching Dana and them. Yeah? I think Will Greer is the – I think I'm not saying a lot right now because a lot of teams are bringing oh, West in. Virginia, yeah, I should throw West Virginia in there too. Yeah, You're I was right. like, I, I, I'm like, come on. Give some love to the Mountaineers, man. Yeah, no, no. no. Will, I, that's my fault. A complete oversight on my fault. That's my fault. West Virginia – West Virginia is probably number three, and then Oklahoma State and Texas. So I would say I'll I'll go – I would go – you're 100% correct. That's 100% wrong by me. Oklahoma, TCU, West Virginia. I think Will Greer obviously gives them an an edge. David Sills is the best wide receiver that nobody knows of. He's – and in the words of my buddy Adam Lefko and Chris Sims, he's a white boy supreme. And – yeah, he he gets the job. Like he's a big receiver. No, he's so like I didn't like again. Big twelve football. I didn't watch a whole lot of it, so I did some research for this. Excuse me, like watching his film. I'm like, wait a <laughs> wait a second. He's transfer <laughs> son. Come on down to Athens. We're the land receiver. <laughs> you guys got Demetrius Robertson um, cleared. We will talk. I, that happened after I recorded the 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 Georgia preview too. Yeah, man, he's cleared. He's good to go. He's really good. I thought he should have played safety, but <laughs> you always think people should play safety. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> All right, let's get out of the Big Ten, Big Twelve, excuse me, and head appropriately to the Big Ten. <sighs> you can't talk about Big Ten without talking about Columbus. Let's start there for a second. It's bad. It's, it's you know it's not just bad. It's the fact that the top two assistants who could have replaced uh, your boy couldn't be repl- couldn't be named because. One's Greg Schiano, and the other one's old buddy from uh, Indiana. Yeah, both of them already have their own scandals. <laughs> you know the scariest part? Urban Meyer, they might bring him back. They might not. As of press time, I have no idea. I hope they don't. He's coming I, back. I know he is. I have to say that, though. I mean, think this about team, it. Like, this team could roll out no coach and win the Big Ten. Um, yeah, I think in theory, 100%. But I also think that it's the same as we talked about with Texas, where you still have to have someone in there to manage those personalities in that locker room. And that's fair. Ryan Day is going to Ryan Day. Well, the best thing that Ryan Day can do is realize that he's in charge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nah, he's got to. You've got to be in charge. You can't be the guy holding the door for someone in charge. Yeah, you got to take that step and be in charge until someone tells you otherwise. Yeah, you got to be in charge, which means don't let Greg Schiano push you around. Don't let Kevin. Charge. He'll try. Don't let Kevin Wilson push you around. He's going to try to. You got to be in charge, and I think that's the job. I think if I'm Ryan Day, I'm talking to Alex Grinch, and I'm letting him know that listen, this is our show. 
we need these two old dudes to listen to what we're saying and let's rock and roll. Um, I love this. Their team is remarkable. Nick Bosa, for all of his ridiculous politics, is a phenomenal player. Um, phenomenal. I think it's, okay, so I said this and got scoffed at by some Ohio State fans. I think he's better than his brother. I think he is better. At this point, at this point in his career. I think he's a better pass rusher than his brother. Okay. I think his brother's a better football player. I think his brother at this point was a better football player. But I think Nick Bosa is better at getting to the quarterback. That's fair. And by the way, they got a guy named Chase Young. He is, he's stupid good. Like, oh, oh, oh my God. If you're a quarterback and you play foot, you have to play Ohio State, just double up on whatever pills you take to get through the pain because. Chase Young and Nick Bosa, those dudes are going to eat your lunch. And then when they go out of the game, they got Jonathan Cooper, who's going to come in and be just a monster, too. Offensively, J.K. Dobbin, Mike Weber, obviously, are very good. I think Dwayne Haskins is interesting to me. I thought Joe Burrow was going to be the starter, 100% full disclosure. I thought Burrow, who's now at LSU, I thought Burrow was going to be the starter. And this is one of those things that you get with Meyer every fourth year, third year where he wants to prove that he can make an NFL quarterback. And Haskins, I think, is his best attempt at it. He pulls a Rick. It's a Rick yeah. to do it at Georgia. And this Haskins is his best opportunity at that. Dwayne is very good. He is, I think Dwayne Haskins is a West Coast, I think he's great West Coast style quarterback. Uh, he has enough arm to push it vertically, but he's at his best from 20 and down. He's super smart. He's changed his entire body at Ohio State. He was kind of a, um, like a dad out there. He wasn't <laughs> like a terrible, like not a terrible body, but like his body wasn't the thing that was getting it, that was getting the job done. It was his brain and, you know, a quick release arm. And now he's morphed into this like ripped up dude and he can run a little bit better than he could when he was in high school, which is good. Even though he's not a runner, he's definitely a thrower. So. I'm rooting for him. I think he's going to play well. Uh, their wide receivers just have to grow up and show up. Well, I think the talent disparity between Ohio State and the rest of the, the, the conference really will allow him to grow up and show up because – Only on offense, though. I, I, I'm saying that their offense will be fine, I think, because the defense is going to be so good. You go to the next team in the division, uh, say what you will about you know what you think about the Harbaugh's. Ten, two 10 win seasons and eight win seasons is not what they paid all that money for in Michigan. Do you think that's the next best team is Michigan? Who, point me somewhere else. Penn State. I've never, I will never believe in Penn State. Really? I, I, look, I'm not, a, I'm not a Saquon Barkley guy. Oh, I'm not a Saquon Barkley guy either. I, I, don't believe that in, I, don't, I still don't believe in that. Like, um, first of all, he had a 40-yard run, and then he finished with five carries for 43 yards in his debut. I wasn't going to talk about how that, great that, it was. I was like, what are we doing? Like, you do realize that this is what he did in college. One good run and then four run that bunch of <laughs> Like, get out of here. We're on the same page there. But I think the biggest loss for them is not Saquon. It's Joe Moorhead. Yeah. He's a genius. So I think that's the tough part. Um, but I think Trace McSorley is very good. Jawan Johnson is very good. Um you throw in the fact that they've got Miles Sanders, who's a very good running back, uh, who's going to get them four yards every single carry and then break a few of them. He won't lose yards dancing. So that's good. And then they have Shane, Shane Simmons and, and Shaka Tony and Sharif something. God, I forgot his name a thousand the times. Loss of the, what's happened the last few years has been for me. I can't take conference superiority over the Big Ten and the SEC by saying, you guys are so top-heavy, the rest of your conference is trash. Because yeah. then I look at the SEC East and I'm like, well, shit. Yep, Sharif Miller is his name. We've turned, into, we've, we've turned into, the, the, we've turned into the, uh, the Big Ten West. Yeah, you've tur- you have. You've turned into Wisconsin, Big yeah. Ten West, Wisconsin and nobody. So, no, I look at that. I think, I think Penn State's probably number two in that, on that side. I think Michigan State and Michigan battle for that number three spot. Um, Brian Lewerke is a name that's going to be called on the day on day two of the NFL draft. The quarterback from Michigan State. His name will be called on day two of the NFL draft. He is somehow good. I, I don't have a way to explain it to you. I don't, but he is. 
Okay, because I have some friends who are fans. I do want to ask this. Scott Frost, <laughs> first year at Nebraska. What, what's a reasonable place for them to land? Eight wins, nine wins, probably second in the division. They'll be better than nine, Minnesota. I'm sorry, nine wins? Yeah. Nine football wins. What do, what do, you, do you think that's crazy? I, no, I don't think it's crazy. It's, just, it, it's, it's more than I was expecting to hear because that's a jump for this team. Listen, they'll lose to Michigan. They'll lose to Wisconsin. They'll lose to Ohio State. They'll lose to Michigan State. Maybe they'll beat Iowa. Maybe they won't. But that's eight wins right there, and then they win a bowl game. That's fair. That's fair. I, I just – I don't know. I, they, I don't know. They, they Scott Frost thing for me, it, it felt like one of those cool hires that was interesting at the time. But just like Tom Herman, I have a question because right, wrong, or indifferent, Nebraska views themselves like a Texas. Yes. Yes, yes they do. And I, the, the pressure from boosters and alumni, and we saw what happened previously there at Nebraska. It's not going to be the most welcoming for someone if he has a kind of hot and – you're positing that he will, and things will go great there, and I hope that's what happens for Scott Frost's sake, but I've watched the Nebraska folks eat their own. It's not pretty. I am curious to watch how they handle, like, we saw them, what they did to Frank Solich, obviously. Ugh. We saw, like, and I, but I'm curious to watch what happens here with Frost, who is 100% beloved there, although they already are upset that he wanted to give the guys a day off to, Which to is, go to... Uh, <laughs> go to the lake or something. I was like, this is insane. Um, so no, I I think that I think they'll be fine. I just I wonder what his recruiting starts to look like over the course of the next probably two, three years. Yeah. Because he needs for him the end game is not to win the Big Ten West. No. It's to win the Big Ten. And to do that, you've got to be in the room with Urban, with Jim, with Franklin. You gotta be in that room and and how do you, as Scott Frost, win that recruiting battle? That's really – because if you're going to try to say you're going to elevate yourself to a higher level of recruit, you've got to make a splash. I think the diff- – I think I will say this. I think the one thing that he can do, if they can win nine games, nine games, nine games, ten games in the next oh. three years, I think the thing that he can do is walk in and say, I've been in your shoes. I know what it's like to be a superstar. These guys don't know what it's like to be a star. I think that is one thing he can not sell. That's true. That's 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 very fair and that's very effective and I've I've seen it used and it's a great sell. My I don't know as we're talking about to get to the point. He has to get to to get as as national as this game has gotten. You're not just fighting with Urbans and Harbaugh's. You're fighting with your uh, Ricks and yep and 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 you're saying he's fighting with Clay Helton and David Shaw and all those guys. You've got – it's one thing to say, hey, we're on the cusp of the Big Ten. It's another thing to say, we're here not just to win the Big Ten because now you've got to go to uh, Louisiana to recruit. You've got to go to Texas. You've got to go to Atlanta. He's got to go to Florida. He's got to go to California. And it's got to be – and that, for me, is the bigger worry because yeah. Urban and Harbaugh didn't get to the, the upper echelons of this division by recruiting just the Big Ten hunting grounds. Yeah. Oh, by the way. They came in with national reps and were able to, people- to separate themselves as a national recruiter. The folks in Michigan are pretty peeved at Jim Harbaugh. I I know. I can't imagine because we're in year three, and that was eight and five last year. I don't oh, no, no, oh, oh, no, 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 not even his winning losing. I mean, like, oh. I mean, like, high school football coaches are not happy with with the way oh. that he's going straight national recruiting, and like, he's given. So he he does the whole offer thing where he's like. Yeah, whatever. This kid's one of the best ones in the state. Sure, we'll offer him. We'll give you a stupid offer. We, you can't commit. Yeah, it's a it's a, one of the empty offers. It's <laughs> interesting because it's the same thing about like we talked about to start the show, bringing it back full circle. When football goes national, something gets yep. lost, and those relationships Local. matter. Yep. And it's it's and that's why I always say that Bama's a better Bama is a bigger job. But, Georgia might be a better one because you're not traveling. You, to, to maintain the relationships in Atlanta is something you do from anywhere. Yep. You can just do it better from Athens. Yeah. Oh, I agree. It's, it's going to be – the Harbaugh thing is going to be really interesting because he's never come into and treated it like the Michigan job. He's treated it like it was a, the job, like a national job. Mm-hmm. But I, think, I, I was unaware of the tensions he was facing inside Michigan, but it makes perfect sense. 
Like he's got kid, like he's he's got kids that he's all that he offered in the state of Michigan. That like he he know he. But the thing is, he wants the best football players, and that's and but that's not that's not conducive to what the uh, the teams want to hear inside the state, especially the exactly. high school team. And I'm not. It's not a knock on him at all. He just wants the best football player. And he's like, this guy's not good enough. I got to give him an offer so that I can save face for this kid that's going to come available in a year. But mm-hmm. I don't want him. What Michigan, this guy. Michigan local has to come to realize is that the best football is not playing in your state. And I think that starts to mess with like local identity more so like in the in like in Oklahoma. But I still think it matters for Michigan because. I guarantee you, if he pulled in a national title with these kids, you would the, the high school coaches wouldn't be as loud. No, not at all. I, 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 I here's, oh, well, okay. We we're talking Michigan. Here's the other thing. Let's talk about this. What's up with the quarterback? He's had three transfers. He's on his third transfer. I thought he was a quarterback whisperer. So now it's Shea Patterson. Who's been and developed by Hugh Freeze. I, it feels very John Gruden win the, win the thing with someone else's players. So Tony, even yeah. if, let's, say, let's say the impossible happened and Harbaugh won this year, won big this year, won the Big Ten, made a playoff. Would he even get the credit? He will. Okay, would he get the credit inside Michigan where it seems that some of the tides are turning against him already? He, Michigan is so – they haven't won the Big Ten since 2004. They're thirsty. They're, thirsty. But they're, they're super thirsty. But what, for me, I don't know. For me, it feels more like I'm just – I feel like Harbaugh gives his detractors a lot of ammo. Yeah. And the ROI for defending him hasn't been that great so far. So how long is that leash? Because – Look, they, again, they did not pay him that money to go eight and five. Oh, I agree. I think people have a problem eating their own shit. That's the, that's that, the whole. There's your bigger issue. I mean, to be, to be 100% candid, right? Like, nobody wants, to, nobody wants to take a shit, turn around, and then shove that in their mouth, which is what it would be if they have to admit that they're not happy with this whole situation. That's fair. Let's go further east. <laughs> You're just to say because, like, oh, the Big Ten. Quite frankly, it's Ohio State and them. Like, I'm sorry. There's a huge gap between Ohio State and everyone else. Mm-hmm. There just is. And I can sit here and pretend that I, I'm encouraged by what I'm hearing out of Michigan or the fact that Shea Patterson's going there or Michigan State. I'm not. I don't think – I honestly think that as far as – Unassailable five kids in college football. Ohio State may have the only one. I think it's that in, it's in their conference. I I think that Shea Patterson will do will work wonders at Michigan because he's played with good wide receivers before, mm-hmm. and he can let these guys know this is what you have to do if you want to win. More importantly, he's played against great defenses. No, no, not more importantly. The thing I said. <laughs> okay, so no, but the thing is, are the receivers at Michigan great? Would you classify them as great? They are. They they have some phenomenal athletes that are at the wide receiver position that run lazy routes that don't fight okay. for fifty so fifty balls. So now we're telling this transfer kid to not only learn a new system but go coach the wideouts. Yeah, one hundred percent. That's I'm one hundred percent. I expect you and I have talked about for years now is that coaches aren't hired to coach anymore. They're hired to recruit. And now we get shit like this, like lazy, lazy routes, where we're counting on a transfer in quarterback to fix an endemic wide receiver problem at a school. Here's the thing. In a nutshell, and you will realize this, like as soon as I say it, you're going to be like, oh, shit, he is right. They had, from the old regime, they had Jake Butt, Jehu Chesson, and Amar Darbo. And those guys were not the fastest, but they could get open. And they, even when they weren't open, they would take the ball from the defensive back and Michigan won 10 games and they went to the orange ball mm-hmm. with Jake Rudock. <laughs> then, then the last year they had Wilton Spate, who's not different, very different from Jake Rudock or John O'Corner, whoever, but they had wide receivers that were freshmen 
who didn't know when they were supposed to be open, who didn't fight for the football. The best one, Tari Black, who did all those things, got hurt in the third game, so he was out for the rest of the year. So when you have wide receivers that don't know when they're supposed to be open, you don't, you, they don't fight for the football. What does the quarterback do? He holds on to the ball a little bit longer so that they can be more open so they're comfortable catching it, right? Yep. And what does that mean when you don't have an offensive line that's super great? That's a sack. Right. Yeah. That's a sack. That's a quarterback getting hit in the face, which we saw multiple times out of Michigan. And I think so many people are so quick to only blame the quarterback for stuff. But if he had receivers that he trusted, the ball would come out quicker. Or wide receivers that knew what they were doing, the ball yeah, would no, come no. out quicker. You're right. I heard you to say, and you are 100% right. I just think that it's a lot to ask of us transfer so quarterbacks. <laughs> But I, 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 but being around Shea, I think it's one of those things that he's going to demand. There you go. And I hope these kids can de- de- deliver it because I, I'm a fan of the kid. I think he's a great quarterback. I, he, yeah. I think that if, if, if things break the right way, he can do something really special in Michigan. But For it sure. shouldn't come down to year four of another transfer quarterback trying to prove to us that Jim Harbaugh can win there. Yeah. ACC, <laughs> I, again, I just said one on the table, five to him, I take it back. There are two because who's fucking with Clemson? This year, nobody. That, 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 okay. Like, that's like, it's one of the things we've been sitting out of the period for this year. Like, wow, there's really a huge gap in some of these conferences. Big gap. Yeah. Like, big gaps. I mean, <laughs> Clemson, is, Clemson looks so good. Their defensive line is sick, dude. That defensive line is terrifying. The fact like, that Kelly Bryant might get challenged at quarterback is terrifying. It's good. It's good for him. No, it's good it's for great them. for him. But, like, it's the. For me, I'm saying it's terrifying if you step back and look at the, how much talent they've assembled in South Carolina. Yeah. Assembled and they have South great wide receivers and running backs. Great wide receivers and running backs. And I I, I just – bravo to Dabo Swinney because he's done it. He's figured out how to win at Clemson. And mm-hmm. I, I don't tell you. Like, it's – it's this is going to be the best team in college football. And now I'm willing to put the stamp on them. All they do is churn out top-tier defensive linemen. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's getting, yeah. like, to the point where, like, after three years, you're like, okay, that's a little weird. Now I'm like, this is getting creepy. Like, I always jokingly called Georgia running back you, but I totally mean it. Yeah. This is D-line you. They are D-line you. And, like, literally, we're talking about a team that's got four guys that are all trying to make sure they get played into the first round. And then behind them, <laughs> they've got, like, six more dudes that are all like, oh, I w- I'm going to be a first-round draft pick, too. And they're not all right, but they're definitely not all wrong. Right, they're, they're not all right. They're not all going to be first round draft picks, but they went to Clemson thinking that they will be. That's the mentality you want to recruit as a kid who wants to be a first round draft pick. They got two five stars that are going to be third string. What? Just, what? <laughs> Clemson, y'all, 2018. There's been, I you told me this story, I don't believe you. 99% of the college football world would cream their jeans if they had one five star. They're going to have two that are just going to be like, well, you know, I just want to take my reps when I can get my reps, you know, situationally. Maybe they'll get me in to rush the passer sometimes. And there's teams that are be like, listen, you come here, we'll give you a car. We'll give you a, we'll give you a, we'll give you a person. <laughs> well, I think the only team that has a chance to even try to make Clemson nervous resides in the Coastal, and that's in Miami. I, yeah. I, obviously, I'm a Rick's fan, but I've also been a big fan of what they've done. He did in year one down there. For sure. And I, I think after winning that first Coastal Division championship, that quarterback battle settled down. But the skills and the uh, defense is there. The defense is great. They got three superstars and then a couple little stars. They got, I mean, Jaquan Johnson is a monster at the safety spot. Shaq Quarterman is amazing. Joe Jackson is – Joseph Jackson is a beast for them on the defensive end spot. Um, Trajan Bandy is going to be a star as well. And then that's defense, – defensively, they're going to be very good. Offensively, Amon Richards is a star. You throw in Travis Homer, who's a top – I think he's probably in the top one-third, one-quarter of all college football running backs. And the big thing for me is going to be, will Rick's conservative, conservative attitude really hurt him this year? Because, as far as play calling? Um, not play calling, but playing. Like, Malik Rozier is going to be the starter. He is. He's a – High, he's a low ceiling, high floor football player. 
and the two guys behind him, or well, the three guys, because Cade Weldon is making a push now, but Jer- Jaron Williams and Nikosi Perry are all three of them are higher ceiling ball players, but obviously way lower floor could make crazy mistakes. And I think that'll come. I think you're you're probably right, just because watching Rick for as long as I did, the probably yep. single got him there. But yep. he's also not one to deny talent. And I think that if, as he builds trust, one of those young guys is going to step up. It's the same way Joe Tarasinski started that season for Georgia, and then he got shadow. Joe Tarasinski. JT three. Once a year, I talk about. Um, oh man. <laughs> No, JT3, he played three games for us and then had that shadow injury and we never saw him again. Yeah. <laughs> it's like he just, he just immediately became a GA and helped out the weight room. It was amazing. Oh, but, my <laughs> God. So terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so funny because I think you're right. I think Rick's propensity to he try to do at, the same thing. He works at UNCC. No, he doesn't. Yeah, he's a he's a he's – a, He's an inside receivers coach in Charlotte. I'm so happy. That's such a great good good for Joe T. <laughs> good, for, good for Joe Terrence. Um, so Miami, Rick, you're right. I think his propensity to go safe will always be there, but I do think that he recognizes when an undeniable talent's there. Yeah. And if one of these guys can gain his trust and spend that time with Rick, because I, you can talk to a lot of people in Athens who feel a lot of different ways about Mark Rick. No one will tell you you couldn't develop a quarterback. No. Oh, one. for sure. He's great at it. It's 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 unreal with the things he can do with the guy in your center who trusts him and listens. And uh, yep. I think if these young guys can do that, the upside, Rick's Rick's conservative. He's not dumb. Yep. And I think that's the line that people thought he flirted with too often at Georgia. Uh, let's stay in the coastal for a second. Virginia Tech to Virginia Tech as they always do. Talk to me about Georgia Tech because I've heard a lot of Chippy Tech fans that, I, that you know I only hear from them before a season, never during Georgia Georgia Tech game week. Never during the football season because I don't think about Tech. Because, again, not a rival. Sorry. Um, is Tech going to be good or is this Zombie Ball Johnson, like, just saying fuck it and try everything? I mean, what's the di- – like, what is, what is good? They won nine games last year. Like, but can they do it again? Because the year before, I believe they won three. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, what? what? They're going to be the same as always. Maybe they win three. Maybe they win none. <laughs> it's a literal crapshoot every year. With, with that. And we do, I talk about this probably during the Tech Week every year. It's hard to maintain a consistent winning si- situation with that offense. Yeah. Because you can't recruit them. You can't. No. I, well, they got, they got Bruce Jordan Swilling, who is a Which very good no player. Sense to me. Makes no I don't know how he got there. What did they pay him? <laughs> Play him, like, him and Trey are both going to be – they're in the two deep. I think Bruce is probably going to end up starting. Trade's going to be a rotational player in the secondary. Um, I think Quay Searcy is very, very good. Uh, Marshall is going to be interesting to watch. So I, I think this team has an opportunity to be good. I think this is a team they probably should be – they probably should be the second best team in the Coastal. With Virginia Tech going through some of the suspensions or whatever they're having to deal with, I think they should, probably should be the second best team in the Coastal. Virginia Tech maybe. So second, third best. Those, the two Techs can battle it out. Um, but I don't think that they're a legitimate threat to win the Coastal the way that Miami is, and I certainly don't think they're a legit threat to win the ACC championship the way that we're talking about Miami trying to challenge Clemson. Is there anything to believe in er, in the early one-year kind of uh, purview of what's going to happen at Florida State, or are we just going to say, well, he's has got a couple years to turn things around? Because – See, like, I know people were very much down on what happened at Florida State last year, and obviously yeah. Jimbo Fisher got run out on rails. But you don't lose your quarterback. It's a very different season. Um, I'm going to say this right now, and this is a Michael Felder public service announcement. Ooh. You better get your wins in right now. If you're NC State, if you're Louisville, get your wins in right now because Willie T is coming for your head. Like, people don't seem to get that, like, running Jimbo out was not a rock bottom for the, the school. Jimbo ran a, himself out. It was that there's too much talent here for what's happening. One yeah. injury couldn't have done this. That talent didn't leave. Jimbo ran himself out. Jimbo ran Rick himself Wall out. Is back with a new quarterback who is a great offensive mind. They got Walt Bell down there, who's one of the, the, I think the most innovative is, offensive coordinators. 
They're only bringing back three starters on defense, but that defense ended up being putrid. So what's the real loss? Um, I think that they're going to play much better defense this year. I think they've got – they have guys for days. So, so I think this is the start of something about, special. Even as we talk about them last year and kind of the quote-unquote disappointment, they won seven. Is this yeah. – t- I know you said get your wins in now. I think that window is already closed. I don't think it's closed yet because yeah. there's still going to be some growing pains. But I think this is a team – whether it's James Blackman or ends up being DeAndre Francois, they're going to push the ball vertically down the field to Nooney, to Gavin. I think DJ Matthews is going to play a bigger role, which is interesting because Jimbo Fisher kind of wasn't in love with – Jimbo Fisher wasn't in love with Nooney or with DJ. And now all of a sudden Willie T gets to town and he's like, yeah, these guys, like they're, they're growing up. They're showing themselves to be leaders for me. So that's going to be interesting. They have Cam Akers and Kalen LeBourne, which is going to be cool. It's a Quandre White has been kicked over to the defensive side because we know they need linebackers. I think this team is going to this, – this team will knock on the door against Clemson. They will knock on the door uh, of the ACC Atlantic Championship. I think Louisville or NC State may beat them because they are a little bit more experienced as far as football teams go. Uh, but they brought in my man Harlan Barnett from Michigan State to coach this defense up. So, hey, baby, let's get it done. I think Levanta Taylor is probably one of the top three corners in all of college football. Stanford Samuels is a he's a sophomore now that made a lot of made a couple plays a year ago. So I'm I've, I'm excited about this team because talking to some of my friends down there at Florida State, the team's excited to be playing football with Jimbo. It was always like a job and a thing they had to do and like just do this. Just it was a slog, and now it's like, hey man. We get to play some football. He's coach is cutting us loose. Let's go do our thing. Right. Well, let's take our last look at a conference yeah. top five and head down to the uh, conference that generated the national championship game last year. The whole game, not one side of it, both sides. Uh, the SEC, and we'll start in the East because I think it's fucking easy to do this. Um, I just did an hour on Georgia yesterday, so we're not going to get too far into it. I do want to say this: something I talked to with about Chad. About with to Chad, what we're seeing recruiting wise in Athens is a little terrifying, and it's something I've never seen as a Georgia fan. It's why I tell people that Bama's the best job in college sports, but Georgia might be a better one because look at what's happened in the last twelve months after Kirby Smart's been hired. It's been absolute pandemonium on the recruiting trail. I know you cover recruiting a lot more than I do, but I, even I can't deny like the numbers, the sheer just volume of high star players that are headed to Athens, can I? No, I mean it's that's facts are facts. I mean, you guys got my big homies Amir White this in this past cycle. Obviously Justin Fields. Um I will tell you this, I know you're 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 a lineman. Jamari Sawyer. Oh, baby. Yeah. You're gonna love him. Oh, he's, I'm so excited. You're gonna he's like my man's like Raphael. Like like the Ninja Turtle. Like he oh, yeah. Like, he's got this attitude about him and this, like, just, I want to bury people every day. He, um, quick story, he was out at the opening in 2016 as a soft, as a, as a rising junior, and he dislocated his finger out at the opening. And I saw it happen, and he was screaming, and the trainer was coming over, and the trainer was like, and I was holding on to, his other, his opposite hand, holding onto his hand while she tried to put it back in place. And then he almost broke my hand <laughs> because, it, because it hurt. And, oh, man, like, just getting to know him was really cool. Like, he's so, he's, the kid, you know, he's, I mean, he's a, he's a tank. Like, there's, he's, once he puts the pads on, he has no neck. So once he puts pads on, his helmet just touches his shoulder pads. And he's just like, okay, well, I'm, I'm invincible now. Let's go kick some ass. So it's, so it's so wild because I've never seen like the level of recruiting, the excitement around recruiting that I have in Athens lately. And yeah. stories like that are the reason why. And we've again yesterday, very long, we did a very deep dive on the Justin Fields, Jake Fromm situation. I don't know where it's going to end up. I do know that um, if there's an offense that's built to break in. A new quarterback again. It's this one yeah. because of the leaps this offensive line took last year. And you can listen to me on all the recorded podcasts I did. I was very critical in yeah. 2016 of this offensive line and going back prior to that. It was one of my constant frustrations when I had a Georgia focused football show. I mean, 
Last year's ben, offensive line was obscene. And they lost ben, one Cleveland was great. ben Cleveland was great. Gallier was great. I mean, they grew up in a hurry, you know? It was, one of the, it was the reason I was nervous about last season was the offensive line. And they shut me up real quick and real fast. Which is fantastic. They were, they were dominant in every game except against Auburn. Yo, know, and then the, the, that was our example last year, last week was go watch the second Auburn game and then watch the old line. Just watch what they do in the second Auburn game. They devour yep. people. Yep. It was amazing. It's, it, it, it was like and the thing that got me about them last year was that the offensive line never looked tired at any mm-hmm. point in the game. And that's why, like, the running backs, obviously, running back you, lots of talent back there. But they're going to make it. Your job's not going to be the hardest thing in the world. No. It's great. They were, they, were, they were very good. I'm looking forward to watching them again this year. Personally, I think Justin Fields is fully capable of being like an Aaron Rodgers type quarterback. So do with that what you will. That was my comp for him coming out. Everyone else was like, well, maybe he's like Russell Wilson. I was like, are you, are you kidding me? <laughs> this Aaron guy can put the ball anywhere. That's a strong comp, man. Is, is, that, is that like, is that, a, is that a, we could see him starting by game three or four? Yeah, I, I think that would it, would it take Fromm melting down to get us there? Though? No, I think it. I, I mean, obviously, and Kirby Smart's got that Nick Saban in him where he don't want to rock the boat. But the the stuff that Justin Fields can do in my time of doing recruiting, I never seen anybody be able to do what he can do in the last ten years. Is that, is that special? Yeah, like Rosen was the best candidate like the best quarterback that I that I recruited up until I saw Fields because Rosen was so polished and so technical and you know he hit checked every box but Fields is polished and technical but also I mean he's an elite athlete like he can if he if if Justin Fields was like you know what screw quarterback I'm going to go be the number 1 tight end or wide receiver, whatever it is, I'm going to go do that. Or I'm going to be, I'm going to play linebacker now. He would be great at it. And you don't, that's not the same thing that would happen with, you know, Fromm could never do that. Right. And that's where he's at. Like he's, I mean, I've watched, I watched him, and obviously it's in shorts, but I watched him play action fake to his right, roll to his left side. So it's, it's his offhand, roll to his left side and on the run throw to the back corner of the end zone to Justin Shorter, who's now at Penn State, and hit him at the apex of a jump where he knew, like, I'm going to put this up here because I know he can get it. This isn't me throwing it away. This is me. I expect this to happen. And he did it, and it was just like, oh, God. Because Fields was supposed to go to Penn State. Yeah. And I was like, oh, God, Penn State's going to – they're going to mash. This is insane. And now he's in Georgia, and he's got an opportunity. Like he is, he's there. He is remarkable. He's incre- incredibly talented and insanely. And I think it comes with baseball because he is a top-notch baseball player as well. I think his ability to recognize that I'm gonna I'm gonna mess up sometimes, but I know that I need to dial. I need to take like it's like in a like in that bat. You get three or four in a game. Okay, this one didn't work out. Now I need to retool, organize this, go back to this. Now I can do this. But he does that in between plays, and it's crazy to watch. Also, you guys got that uh, – what's that big country kid y'all got, the tight end? Luke Ford? Uh, uh, what's that again? Luke Ford? Yes. Um, it's a very country name. Let me tell you something. He's going to knock somebody's dick in the dirt. Well, huh, let's I'll stay in the East for a second because <laughs> – Again, I'm very excited for Georgia as a very, very cocky podcast. Um, but let's talk about who's playing for second because could things happen very South quickly? Carolina. With Dan- South, South Carolina. Carolina. Could things happen very quickly with Dan Mullen in Florida? I don't no. think that. I don't think shit, man. No. Is it that bad? He, he, he said it. Not me. He said it. Yeah, but see, coaches always say that shit to downplay expectation. No, he said it. He said. These four guys I have at quarterback aren't nearly as far along as I thought they would be. He said it. And he said four guys, which means everyone is getting reps. Which is absurd. Which which is a bigger indictment of the previous staff than I ever thought you could give. It's absurd. 
<laughs> How is the coverage that bare at Florida? Yeah, it's not. They're they're going to be fine. They'll win seven games. They maybe win eight. They'll be fine. But no, South Carolina is the second best team in that division. And Jake I feel, Bentley, I feel, I feel even better about the division now that you said that. Jake Bentley is a good quarterback. I like him. I like Debo Samuel. I think Brian Edwards is a wide receiver that more people should talk about. And I think South Carolina, they can win nine football games. They will lose to Georgia. Um, depending on their crossovers, we'll see how they finish, like in terms of wins loss. But they're the, I think South Carolina is number two, Georgia number one, South Carolina number two. I think Florida's probably number three. Tennessee is probably Tennessee, Kentucky can fight for that four or five spot. Tennessee is interesting because they also said they have a four quarterback battle. Excuse me. Florida said they had three with Kyle Trask, Emory Jones, and Felipe Franks. Tennessee has four with Will McBride, JT Shrout, Keller Christ, and Jarrett Garantano. So, t- like, and here's this is okay. Let me, let me, I want to hear you respond to this. Tennessee said, um, the number one thing that we want out of our quarterback is to take care of the ball. And then they said the number two thing we want is for them to be aggressive. And I was like, oh, those are two things that don't exist together. Like, what are you saying? Good luck, Jeremy Pruitt. I mean, that with, I mean, with all the malice in my heart. I realize this offseason, there's not a team I hate more in the world than Tennessee. Why do you? Why? Why would you waste energy on hating them? No, no, it's just one of those things that, like, there's a more, like, Florida, my hatred is more like res- resignation. You gotta remember, I had a head kicked in my Florida my entire childhood. Oh, so, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. True, 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 true. So the next down on the people who I hate but I feel relatable to, it's definitely Tennessee. That color orange, that stupid song, the, the ball navy, all the hate it all. And the fact that they're going to be bad under Jeremy Pruitt, it means a lot to me. I do want to ask you about one team in the East that came up yesterday and it kind of intrigued me. Drew Locke had a great end to his season last year at Mizzou. Bang, bang, they bang. They make a lot of stuff in the receiving core, but they also brought Derek Dooley to call their plays. Um. I mean, I don't know how it's going to work. The defense gave up 31 and a half last year. They've got to improve that number. But even with that improvement, we know the talent that's on the offense. I don't know if Derek Dewey's got to do it. I just, ew, that one makes me super nervous. They're not going to be good. That's fair. Drew Locke is good. They are bad. <laughs> Drew Locke is good. They are bad. That's Drew fair. Locke was in the Elite 11 with, with Josh Rosen. He's a he's a he's a Josh Rosen, Sam Darnold, like he's in yeah. that whole group. Like he's yeah. good. Like this isn't a surprise. He didn't come out of nowhere. He was an elite kid coming out, and he just ended up going to Mizzou, and finally is getting a pop. He's good though. He's a quality quarterback. Kick and throw. He can make every throw. I was watching some cut ups of him, and he can. Like I've watched him a couple times from the right hash throw the ball to the left numbers, and I was like, whoa, like. Okay, that's that's grown. That's some grown man stuff right there. Like that's a that's a real deal throw. Like you you're not supposed to be throwing a hitch to the yeah. far numbers from the far. Don't throw, the big Don't throw later in the middle. Do not throw a backside hitch. And he threw. He he throws several of them, and the defensive back is still like in their break, and he's already got the ball out there. And I'm like, that's a special throw. Yeah. And Too I lock. think probably Too after lock. Herbert, I'd go lock as my number two guy for the next year's draft. He pisses me off because he's so good, but he's stuck in the zoo. Um, Let's go West. I think we both agree Bama's the class of the West, but there's not as big a gap between Georgia and your eye, South Carolina, um, as the gap would be between Alabama and the people chasing them. Bama lost their entire secondary. Time out, time out. There's not as big a gap between Alabama and Auburn. There are people chasing, that counts. But they, that's just a, that's person. Every after Auburn, sorry. I don't need. I I can make a case though after Auburn. We're gonna do this because um your boys at Michigan uh, Mississippi State. He's gonna need to play with. He's gonna need to play with Mullen's toys. Morehead's a great OC. He's a phenomenal offensive coordinator. I love him. I just the idea that. The idea that they're legit contenders, I just I can't buy it. I mean, not legit contenders, but I think they're going to be very interesting because you've got a dynamic quarterback in was it uh, Fitzgerald? You got great yeah. defensive linemen up front in Simmons and Sweat. Like there, there's stuff there that makes 
Michigan, Mississippi State, excuse me, intriguing to me. But let's start with Alabama first because the only questions I have for you are one, you got to replace an entire second year. Good luck, my dudes. And two, who's under center? Tua, obviously. So what happens to your boy? He's graduating in December. Yo. I know the fact that you and I wait, know. Did you not, wait, did you not? Did you really not know that? I did know, but like I, I thought. So I wanted to get it on wax because you and I know some of the less than, the more than shady things that uh, yeah. our boys tends to do with his roster. Sure. This is the loudest and biggest one though. Like this is going to be a yeah. deal on national media. One hundred percent. He's so Jalen Hurts. The reason he didn't transfer is because he's graduating in December which means he will be able to go wherever he wants to go to school to play football without having Going to sit out. The AD, yeah. Without having to sit out a year. Um, I think if we're going to talk about the most interesting thing to watch with Jalen Hurts, it will be if Nick Saban burns up a year on him. Hmm. Because in th- with the new redshirt rule, if Jalen Hurts plays in four or fewer games, he can save this entire year and then still have two full years of eligibility left. Hmm. Or he gets in five games, four games, six games, whatever. And now he has the burn a year and only has one year left to play. That's the part to me that's the most interesting thing to watch. Good point. It's a really good point. Uh, the rest of the West, Auburn, like you talked about them already. I think under the radar, people forget that Auburn won the West. Yeah, Auburn's good. Um, I'm very curious to watch Nate Craig Myers get more touches as a wide receiver. Uh, obviously, they also have Darius Slayton, Eli Stove. Uh, those guys are all going to be very much involved. I'm looking forward to seeing a healthy Cam Martin get out there. Stidham is another quarterback that a lot of people really like from an NFL draft standpoint. I think he still needs to show a little bit more. Uh, maybe that some of that has to do with what they ask him to do a lot, but he he has to show that he can control the game a little better. I think that Nick Coe, who has an opportunity to start at the Buck, uh, but will probably end up backing backing up Marlon Davidson. I think Nick Coe is the best uh, defensive lineman that nobody's even talking about. Marlon Davidson, Dante Davis Russell are both obviously very good. They're names that everybody knows. Mm-hmm. This Auburn team is probably the third best team in the SEC behind – I'm sorry to say, obviously, the third best team behind Georgia and Alabama. And they're probably the 10th best team in the country. Well, you look at Auburn's schedule. They got Washington and Atlanta on the 1st of September, and they go to Starkville, they go to Starkville on October 6th. This could very well lead them into an undefeated matchup with Georgia in Athens on November 10th. And I don't want that at all in my life. But I think that's probably going to be what happens. So I go to one Georgia game a year, and I, and I got invited to the Auburn game, and I said, not this year. I think I'm going to go to the Tennessee game and just enjoy that. There you go. Have some fun. Why not? Just enjoy the fact that you need to the hell be out of them. LSU versus the Aggies playing for third and fourth in the, uh, in the West, in my opinion. Who do you have there? Because obviously I already wait, made my wait, 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 wait. They can't be playing for third and fourth if you said Mississippi State's going to be good. Uh, State is my outlier. That's my that's my hope. That's my dream pick. That's my now I think <laughs> I think I honestly think that giving Moorhead Mullins tools is not a great idea for people who want to play Mississippi State. I think they're gonna play spoiler a lot more than they are gonna be a real contender this year, but I thought that about Georgia last year, so maybe I'll be wrong. But let's talk about the two established names out west in the Aggies and LSU. You told me earlier LSU sucks, which is fine. Uh, I think that they've been sunk by the Orgeron hire. I think it was just a bad hire. I think yeah. at the time it was like the thing to do, and then like 20 minutes later, like, wait a, wait a second, what we do? Do we really just did that? <laughs> um, LSU's defense is going to be very good. Uh, I love Devin White. Um, by the way, shout out to all you LSU fans that were like, no, he's a running back. And I was like, oh, really? Because he could be the best linebacker that you guys have had in a decade. So get out of my face. Uh, Clavon Chasen is very good. Greedy Williams is a top three corner in college football. Grant Delpit had one of the best seasons of a freshman safety in the history of college sports, which nobody talks about because a lot of people don't pay attention to what safeties are doing. And shout out to Breeden Fihoko, a former five-star defensive tackle 
who went to Texas Tech and then transferred to LSU. In addition to Richard Lawrence, Glenn Logan, and, and, and Edwin Alexander, they've got a lot of pieces defensively. The problem is offense, where who, who's the offensive guy? For, I don't even remember the guy's name now, who's the offensive coordinator. They got rid of that Canada. And I just, I don't know what's going to happen, man. I don't know what's going to happen with this offense. And it's quite frankly, it sucks. Like we, we joked about Alabama, me being frustrated with their defensive back play because the guys are so good. But watching LSU play, knowing how good their players are and how good their players could be if they had a competent scheme and competent coaching. I just don't want, I don't like seeing guys waste time of their, like waste four or five years of their life doing just banging their head against the wall. And until we see some confidence in LSU's actual offensive approach to the game, that's what we're, that's what's going to happen. Okay. So hold up. What's the ceiling for Jimbo's first year in, in uh, Aggieland? Ooh, the ceiling for him is eight wins. Maybe nine, right? Eight in a bowl. I could see that. Eight, nine in a bowl game, like nine wins with the bowl. But I mean, their schedule, the schedule is what it is, right? Like, it's not super challenging. Like, this, it's, I'm not going to say it's not super challenging. It's not, um, it's not, it's not new. Like, they play Clemson, which they're, they're going to lose that football game. And, but they got, I mean, they, they're going to, they play Clemson, they play Alabama. That's one, two losses. Uh, they can beat South Carolina. They'll lose to Auburn. That's three losses. They have three for sure losses on the schedule. And then the, after that, every game's, a, a, you know, they can, they could, they could win. Okay. Well, I do appreciate you coming on here. Do you have a second? Is this a news just broke? I just got tweeted something. Uh oh. Jeff Snook, beat reporter for Ohio State. I saw it. Of course, the Texas head coach, Tom Herman, tipped off Brett McMurphy about the Zach Smith situation. This doesn't change anything for you and I, because I think you and I both center the victim in all of this. Does this change how nationally it's going to be framed as a discussion? Because what we've seen is it's gone from a story about domestic abuse to a story about firing coaches to now it's going to become a story about negative recruiting. And this makes me fucking sick because there is a victim here. Yeah, I think that what it what it what happens now is people are like, "Oh, see, he doesn't like him," and that's not that shouldn't be the point. And exactly, it just like I I don't know seeing this stuff. And obviously, I'll full disclosure: Brett McMurphy is a new stadium employee. Um, Great gift by you guys, by the way. Yeah. So what it just. I don't know, man. Like Snook is the same guy that also reported the 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 Earl Bruce Earl Bruce's daughter, I believe, who's the mother of Zach Smith. Is that correct? Yes. She was like, "No, this never happened. She's lying. She was telling me she was lying the whole time." And then Brett McMurphy was like, mm, "Well, I talked to this lady, and this is what she said about it." So it's just very, it's a mess, man. Honestly, I don't. I guess I just don't understand. Like. To lie on this scale with, with respect to domestic abuse is, quite frankly, unheard of. And yeah. I just, so I have a hard time. These, there's a lot of people that their, their first instinct or they're very willing to believe that, oh, she's just lying. It's fine. Which is so weird. It'll always be weird to me and gross. So it's very frustrating to see people reveal themselves in all of this. I think is that I think that's the big my kind of, you know, from 50,000 feet kind of takeaway is it's just very frustrating to see people reveal themselves and the thing that you can do is just kind of keep those people out of your life, right? You know? Amen to that. Felderman, thank you for coming on. This is always a fun podcast for me even though you normally douse my UGA dreams, you you, you made me feel better this year, which means it's going to be like a two-win season, and I hate you preemptively. Uh, you can follow him at, at In the Bleachers on Twitter. He's, a favorite tw- He's your favorite Twitter, his favorite Twitter. Please tell them everywhere they can find you, man. All right, so for college football, you can follow me on Twitter at In the Bleachers. That's just In the Bleachers on Twitter. 
You can also follow, find me at Watch Stadium, at Watch Stadium on Twitter. Uh, also on Facebook at the Michael Felder is my Facebook thing. I don't, I don't plug that a ton, but that's a thing that I have. <laughs> it was why I had to take a second to think about it. Um, but also make sure you download the stadium app. We're going to be broadcasting a couple broadcasting high school football and college football games. Plus every day I'm going to have a show. So <laughs> your boy is getting to do a show and doing two shows, actually working with Kristen Balboni, which has been pretty fun. And if you don't like football at all, why would you be listening to this? But you do like cooking, follow me on Instagram at it's Felder, I-T-S-F-E-L-D-E-R. That is where all my cooking goes. You will never see me post anything about football. It will be only about cooking, maybe some sneakers. I took my Supreme book bag out of the bag today, and then I put it back in the bag because I don't want to lose the value. But you'll see some like some weird hype beast stuff. I got to go to this store in Chicago that sells a bunch of Supreme stuff. So it's pretty tight. Come watch Felder cook good food and spend good money. That's yeah. basically what it's <laughs> Yes. Right. yes. This podcast week, day two is in the books. Come back tomorrow, day three. We got Barso on, my old left tackle from college, and we're going to be previewing AFC football, doing over unders for each team, and talking about the funny stories and basically making fun of the Patriots for about 20 minutes. Uh, that was your show. This is your after. See you guys tomorrow. Oh.